So today we're going to um, get into this, the first chapter and just cover a few verses and just get that foundation. How about we pray again and ask God to help us hear His Word. Father, we do thank You that You're a God who is living, a God who is generous, a God who is compassionate and gracious. Lord, that You brought us here this morning to sit under Your Word, to hear from You, and that we have Your Spirit that speaks to us and that moves us so we can live for You. And we do pray now, Lord, as we um, come before it, Lord, that you will still our hearts, that you will give us a, a heart of humility that will uh, want to receive it and want to know how we can live lives of wisdom knowing you. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, what I've realized as I go through social media all the time is that um, the more followers you have, apparently the more wisdom you have. And, and the more followers you have, the more you can share your thoughts and your opinions, and people will take it as gospel, as, as wisdom. It's so interesting. Uh, celebrities, for example. Celebrities always come out, they say things, and everyone just grabs onto them as if they're gems of wisdom. Let me share with you a few of them that I found as I Googled. Uh, you can... Try and guess these as I go, but I'll just share with you. Believe in your flyness. Conquer your shyness. Come on, some people got to know who that is. Kanye, Kanye West. You can't fly unless you let yourself fall. It sounds like an ancient proverb, but it's Justin Bieber. I like this one. Eat clean to stay fit. Have a burger to stay sane. 100%. Uh, that's um, Gigi Hadid, the supermodel. Wit beyond measure is a man's greatest treasure. Everyone's favorite author, J.K. Rowling. Wit beyond measure is a man's greatest treasure. I'm sure you can think of many others as you scroll through social media or, or search online. There's all these people who share these one-liners as if they're wisdom, the wisdom that uh, we should live by. You've got Tony Robbins, Oprah Winfrey, Jordan Peterson, and we scroll and look for these things, hoping that they'll give you some sort of secret potion to where to find happiness, to how to find purpose in this life. But not even in our Western context, is it? In every context, in every culture in the world, it's, it's full of wisdom gurus, people who will tell us how to live better lives, where to find purpose and meaning and happiness. From life coaches to lifestyle bloggers to the mass amount of self-help books on our shelves, health and happiness that, that flood our shelves in bookstores, our society and our generation are all seeking something, aren't they? We're all in the search for wisdom, for how to live this life that we've been given. But are they the best options? Surely the one-liners are catchy, they feel good, they sound good, but are they always good? Will they help us pursue a life that's full and purposeful as God intended for us? Where are you and I seeking wisdom from? When you're asking what career path should I take, who should I marry, how can I best love my spouse and my kids, how do I best use my money? How do I do retirement well? Don't we want wisdom on these issues? And while there are some great books on self-help and authors like Jordan Peterson, whatever, helping a generation of young men learn responsibility, I also think we need to figure out ourselves where wisdom begins. Everyone is yearning for truth, for wisdom, and although there is a lot of collective wisdom in our society, at the heart of it, the life coaches, the self-help gurus, the, the social media influencers, all of them really are just like you and I, flawed human beings trying to figure out how to do life as well. They just happen to have the microphone. They just happen to have the platform to voice it. Let's be real. We're all on a search for truth and wisdom, aren't we? Even they are. What if we could go to the source of wisdom itself and learn how to live well and wisely as God intended for us? Live well under the creator and maker of us all. That's what we're going to do this week, and we're going to have a taste of what the Proverbs have, has to offer. Before I go on, let me say that the book of Proverbs isn't set out necessarily to be just a bunch of words and, and motivational, inspirational quotes, you know, the, 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 the Proverbs that you see on fridge magnets. It is set out to have structure, like I said earlier, chapters 1 to 9. It's written like lectures from a father to a son. It gives us a big picture about what this wisdom is. Uh, the wisdom of God, it's, it's woven into the fabric of the world. The, the word wisdom itself in Hebrews is chokmah, I think I said that right, chokmah. And, and the idea is, it's this, the skill of understanding how to live within the grains, live uh, along the grain, 
of how the world has been created. You could say that the first nine chapters are to help us uh, focus on how to make us wise. And from 10 to 31, it's where we get a lot of those wise saying, what wisdom practically looks like in this life. And when you get to chapter 31, it's that famous you know, poem that many of us know that, that haunts a lot of women. You know, it's the whole the, the Proverbs 31 women, woman. And that's really just bringing it all together for us. It's actually applicable to all of us to understand how wisdom plays out in our lives. It's so much more than just a, a car bumper sticker, isn't it, the, the Proverbs? So much more than just a random fridge magnet. And so much more than a list of rules for us to obey for our salvation. It all begins with a relationship. That's what we're going to discover today. Now, wisdom is not a new concept for God's people, Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6, I'm just going to I'll read this to you. Moses, well, it's, it's, you can read it later, sorry. Moses told them to keep God's command that that will be your wisdom. That will be your understanding in the sight of the people. When they all hear the statutes, they will, keep, they, will, they will remember the wisdom and understanding. For God's people, wisdom was and should continue to be our pursuit as we live in God's world. And so with Proverbs, we're learning how God set up the world to work in His wisdom. All right, let's read verse 1 to 3 again. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair. Let's unpack that first. Solomon, great king of Israel in the Old Testament. One day he was making sacrifices to God and God shows up uh, in his dream and says, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And you can read about this in 1 Kings chapter 3 as well. Solomon answers and says, I'm your servant. You've given me this great nation to take care of. Give me a heart of wisdom. Give me a heart of discernment to understand right from wrong and to govern your people. And we have this book now, Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. That first line, it's packed, with, isn't it, with, with history. It's packed with, with understanding of, 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 of God's people and, and, uh, and how God is at work. He gives the king, Solomon, wisdom. And we have this book, this, these collection of lectures and short sayings. What purpose? For what purpose do we have this for us? Why do we need the Proverbs? Verse 2 says to gain wisdom, to gain instruction. Wisdom is so much more than head knowledge. It's about understanding how to apply the knowledge to our hearts and how to live in this world. It's about instruction on how we behave so we can pursue what is right, just, and fair. Integrity, justice, righteousness, living wisely a life under God and in God's world. Not just for our benefit, but for those around us to create the harmonious society to live in. If you were asked, what's your, what's, what kind of superpower would you have? You know those icebreaker questions? What kind of, wisdom isn't the first choice, is it, usually? Usually we would say telekinesis, telepathy, teleportation maybe, fly and invisibility. But it seems clearer and clearer when you look around. People actually do want wisdom. We all want to know how to be happy. We all want to know how to flourish in this life. That's why there's a jobs now called life coaches. I don't re remember careers being a life coach 50 years ago, well, I wasn't around 50, but you know, life coaches, you could do that as a job now, help people flourish, thrive. Across every generation, there's been a pursuit for wisdom. And so for us, who better to give it than King Solomon, who was granted God's wisdom? As we go through the Proverbs, I'm going to keep giving these caveats, as we go through the, pro the Proverbs, yes, uh, they are words of wisdom but they're more like principles to life as well. The thing about Proverbs is they're wise sayings, they're generally true, but they won't always be true. Uh, I've heard it phrased like this before, Pro Proverbs are more about, um, Proverbs are about probabilities, not promises. Uh, and think about it, like when you think about Proverbs in everyday language, you know, they're thrown at us all the time, uh, from a really young age even. Uh, sometimes they're true and sometimes they're not. Uh, when I was a kid, I remember being told, uh, an apple a day keeps a the doctor away. But, you know, I'm sure apples are nutritious and all that, healthy for you. But surely, right, some of you guys eat apples every day, right, maybe. You still get sick, don't you? You still have to see the doctors. I mean, if I could eat an apple a day to keep the doctor away, sign me up. Oh, man, I'll eat an apple till the day I die. Click subscribe. How about this proverb, good things come to those who wait? I mean, good things happen to those who don't wait as well. Uh, it's better to be safe than sorry, but what if I was safe and I still end up sorry? I mean, I discovered there's a bunch of wise everyday sayings that also contradict each other as well. People will say, you're never too old to learn new things, but then they also say, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. 
the early bird catches the worm. My mum used to always say this because I always slept in. But there's this other saying, the second mouse catches the cheese. I like to think of myself as a second mouse. Don't judge a book by its cover. That's what they tell you. That was my favorite, right? Don't judge me. Don't judge a book by its cover. You know, but then go for a job interview. What do the people tell you? Dress to impress. Clothes make the man. And we're going to see that in the Proverbs as well. They aren't always going to turn out the way the proverb says. Life doesn't always turn out perfectly, ideally. You could go to uh, Proverbs 22, verse 6. It talks about raising your children on the right path. And when they're older, they won't turn away from it. That's sometimes true, not always true. You can raise them well, but they might still rebel and go down a destructive path. You see, that's how we're meant to see the Proverbs. They're going to help us. They're going to give us a, a, a ideal, a, an ideal way to how we live, wise ways to live life. But they're general principles. How to live under the godly life under our good and great God. They're written by God for us, living in this world. They're designed for the flourishing and thriving of humanity. We need the Proverbs. But secondly, who is it for? Verse 4, let's read that. For giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance for understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. Who is it for? Firstly, it says, to those who are simple and young. Now, simple might be translated better as inexperienced, because the reality is when we're young, we are inexperienced. We are a bit simple. Kids don't know much. We have to teach them. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Folly is bound up in the heart of a child. It's not stupidity. It's just not wisdom. Kids have to be taught things, to know what is right from wrong. Otherwise, it can be disastrous and dangerous. There was an article that came out earlier this year in the news I, I came across about Alexa, the Amazon you know, home device, voice assistant thing. Uh, you talk to it, and a child asked Alexa for a challenge to do. And Alexa said to the child, plug in a phone charger about halfway into a wall outlet, then touch a coin to the exposed prongs. And so... It was a TikTok challenge, apparently. It was viral. It was to cause electric shocks, right? It's so dangerous, though, isn't it? And we know that as adults, you don't do something like that. You don't poke metal things into live outlets, do we? But kids need to be told those things. Uh, there's a truth that, that wisdom comes with age. Uh, one of the guys at Grace Point, Jeff, Jeff Lai, when I was in my tw 20s, uh, he used to say to me, because he was in his 30s, uh, Mikey... Mikey, your 30s are your best years. <laughs> you know, but I was really, I was young and fit and I could eat anything in my 20s. I don't know what he was talking about, but now I am in my 30s. And yes, I do have a bad back. I have high cholesterol. No, I think I have high cholesterol. But at the same time, I get it. I've learned that being healthy and fit is a good thing. But the best part about being in my 30s is actually I know myself better. I understand myself better. We've experienced, I've experienced different situations and events, and I've, heard, I've, I've learned hard lessons. You don't have that wisdom in your 20s. The thing is, when you're in your 20s, you feel like you do know everything, and you need to prove to the world how mature you are. And I guess teenagers do this too. But the truth is, we're inexperienced in our 20s. There's still so much learning to, to, to do. I know you might want to fight me on this, but it's true. We haven't lived long enough to experience life, a lot of life, and what life brings you. I know many of you feel grown up. You've got your independence, you live out of home, you might have traveled around the world, did stuff like that, but there's so much more. It's about heartbreak, it's about grief, it's about loss, it's about mistakes, it's about struggles, but it's also about joy and ambitions and achievements and growing in your faith. It's all those things you have to learn to navigate through and come through on the other end and grow from that and gain wisdom. And I'm so sure that the men and women here in the room that are older than me, you're thinking, Mikey, you're still so experienced. <laughs> you're 100% right. For example, I, I have a daughter. She's only 13 months old. I don't know what it looks like to raise a teenage daughter. I'll need wisdom on that in the future, a lot of wisdom. And, and, it's, and it's crazy, I'm at a church, right, with uh, a, a young church, and we planted it seven years ago, and 
Heidi and I, we're, the, we're like the oldest <laughs> in our church. We have about six, seven people who are older than 40 in our church. And I, I miss that about Grace Point. I miss that there were, there were uh, older men and women in our church that we could talk to and gain wisdom from, who, who love Jesus. I'm young, and we're all young in some sense, where there's still a lot of learning to go. Let's be humble to accept that we need wisdom. Right, young people? Right. Because even if you're older than me, though, if you're older than me, don't think you're off the hook. Solomon wants you to know the Proverbs are for you too. Verse 5, let the wise listen and add to their learning. Let the discerning get guidance. All right, just because you might be older, there's still a lot of learning to do. We should never stop learning, never stop growing, never think we don't need more wisdom in life. No matter how old we are, we can never be wise enough. We need to have that humble disposition to be a student for life, always learning, always growing discernment, seeking wisdom. It's one of those things that we'll, we'll grow in over our whole lifetime, not just a one-off. I've got wisdom now, I'm done. No, it's not like that. Keep learning and growing. And the reality is every generation changes, doesn't it? And as we keep growing, as the years go on and, and, and the times change, we need more wisdom on how to live in these times. You know, I, I'm sure you can ask any person that, uh, ask Yoda, <laughs> Confucius, whoever it might be that you think is a wise sage, even they have more wisdom that they need to learn. Wisdom is for all people. Right? So why do we need wisdom? Who's it for? Lastly, how do we get it? Verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The foundation of knowledge and wisdom begins with fear of the Lord. When we hear fear, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Spiders, snakes, heights, public speaking, sending a message to a crush, being left on scene. Oh, biggest fear. I know, hey, that's scary. Uh, We often hear these words, fear and God, in the same sentence, though. Uh, And and we, uh, our unchurched friends, instantly think of this angry God who will punish us, so we should be afraid of Him. And maybe that was you growing up in a household where you felt a fear from your parents whenever you disobeyed them. Uh, when my dad reached for the fly swatter, I ran in fear. Life, that was life growing up, right? And so we project this idea onto God. Fear God means I should be afraid of Him and His wrath. But that's not the fear of the Lord mentioned here. It's not simply about doing, being terrified and afraid of God. Then you'll have wisdom. No, it means to acknowledge Him for who He is. Powerful, perfect, the ruler and judge of the world. Uh, a fear that comes with awe and reverence when you stand before something so grand and majestic that you feel small. I love how uh, C.S. Lewis put, puts it. He helps us to understand the fear of God in, in the Narnia books, if you've read them. Uh, there's a moment where Mr. Beaver, he talks to Aslan. These are the characters in the book, if you haven't read it. Uh, Mr. Beaver talks to Aslan, who is a, he's a lion <laughs> in this fantasy world. Aslan is respected by all the animals. Mr. Beaver is talking to Susan and says, Aslan is a lion. The lion. Oh, said Susan. I thought, I thought he was a man. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. Safe? said Mr. Beaver. Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. He isn't safe, but he's good. God isn't going to be some chummy, soft bunny rabbit. If we stood before God, we'd feel a little nervous, standing before his greatness and power and majesty the judge and the rule of the universe, I don't think we'll feel safe. But the Bible also says we can trust Him. He is good. He is kind. He's slow to anger, abounding in love. When it says fear of the Lord, it's the res- that respect and awe that is deserving of who He is, acknowledging that He is God and He created the world and created you and I. He is the King. And to know Him as God is to fear Him in reverence and awe. But as we fear Him in reverence and awe, it's also to, to know that reverence looks like turning away from sin and turning to Him. It's to repent of evil. So you got uh, passages in, in the Bible, like Job 28, 28. I'll read it. It says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. To shun evil is understanding. You know, it's in the same sentence there to understand the fear of the Lord, that's wisdom. It's to turn away from evil, to shun evil. We cannot fear the Lord and love evil. That in no way reveres God. But when we acknowledge Him as God, it comes with that dependence and trust. It comes with repentance. As we go to Proverbs uh, 3, 5 to 6 as well, uh, it's this, this trust in the Lord. It says this, 3, 5 to 6, if you have your Bibles, you can just flip to it as well. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not on your understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to Him, and He will make your path straight. Right? The search for wisdom begins with this relationship with God, one that trusts and depends on Him and has faith in Him. We want wisdom to figure out life, how to be the best uh, person we can be, the best father, mother, the best sister, brother, best friend. We want to make the best choices. It begins with knowing who created us. It begins with a relationship with God Himself, who is the source of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, beginning of understanding. The alternative is foolishness, the proverb says. Foolishness, uh, but the fools despise wisdom and instruction. To reject the Lord is to reject wisdom, the one who created and designed the world as it is. Doesn't that all make sense? Shouldn't we seek to live in God's world and the wisdom He created the world with? To live with God's wisdom is to go with the grain of how He created us. And so the Proverbs paint that picture for us. When we come to God as a creator, we see a God who set the world into motion, a God who puts everything in its right place. That there is so much complexity in this world, right? Even in in the food chain, in photosynthesis, even in the human body alone, God has created it all. So the world turns with the tides and the sun and everything is sustained so harmoniously. If God is the creator, doesn't it make sense then that He knows the rules and the principles by which we should live by? Imagine if you played a game of basketball and you're playing and someone starts tackling you to the ground, other people are kicking the basketball. It'd be absolute chaos, wouldn't it? When we understand God, we'll be able to understand how to live in this world in the way that He created it. We'll be able to live in line with how He intended it for us. Proverbs 8, actually, if you go to this um, Proverbs, this is, I'm going to read this, this is a, a big chunk here, Proverbs 8 from verse 22. It actually is really something special. It personifies God's wisdom for us in His creation. Proverbs 8. The Lord brought me forth as the first of His works before His deeds of old. I was formed long ago, ages ago, at the very beginning when the world came to be, when there were no watery depths, I was given birth, when there were no springs overflowing with water, before the mountains were settled in place, before the hills I was given birth, before He made the world or its fields, or any of the dust of the earth, I was there when He set the heavens in place, when He marked out the horizon on the face of the deep, when He established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep, when He gave the seeds boundaries, so the waters would not overstep His command, and when He marked out the foundations of the earth. That's wisdom. God created the world in wisdom. He's the designer, the architect, the builder, and He put it all, He put all the right foundations down. So it's not by random chance everything works so seamlessly. There's an order. Wisdom, there are rules for how things are meant to be. And when we live by the rules of the game, don't we enjoy it so much more, knowing how we can thrive in it? It sucks, right? To play a game, you don't know what you're doing. If you ever told me to play AFL, I would have no idea But what if the game of life came with a set of instructions? Isn't that what the Proverbs are? Wisdom on how to live well in this world. And just as God is a creator God, He's also a covenant God, a God of promise. Yes, He's a creator and He's a covenant God. He makes promises to His people and He's faithful to His promises. You see where it says fear of the Lord, the Lord there, that's capital L-O-R-D, Lord. It's a reference to His personal name, the personal name He gives to His people the name Yahweh. Yahweh is the name He gives to His people back in Exodus when, 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 the, when the people of Israel being rescued from slavery under the clutches of Pharaoh. They're freed from slavery and God announces His name to the people as Yahweh. So it's not just fear of your Creator God, it's fear of your covenant God, the one who is good to His people, gracious and compassionate and loving. You know, actually, it was in my days at Grace Point, and, um, and, and it was huge, actually. He used to always say this, God is both good and He's great. Does He still say that? God is both good and He's great. Great because He's the designer, the architect, the creator, who created the universe with majesty and power. But He's good because He knows us. He knows our needs. He's personal, and He invites us into a relationship with Him. That fear of God, the fear of the beginning of wisdom, that fear of this is a fear of a personal God. That's the beginning of wisdom. And for us who are Christians, isn't that who we have in Christ? 
when we read the words of fear of the Lord, doesn't that transport us to the God who has shown us his goodness and greatness at the cross? The one we stand in awe and reverence of? If you go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17, I don't know how fast you can get there, but let me just read it for you. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rules or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Isn't Jesus the creator God we know? To be... To be honest, it sounds a bit like what I just read in chapter 8 of Proverbs, doesn't it? Wisdom personified. Isn't that Christ? Wisdom, like, like Jesus was there at the creation, forming the world, creating the world, designing it and building it. It's through Him the world is maintained and sustained. He holds it all together. And so when we hear the name of Yahweh, what do we remember? We remember the promise, yes, that He rescued His people from Egypt, that He'll, re- he'll, he'll rescue His creation from sin and death itself. The promises that the Bible speaks of, God who will save his people from the sin, that promise was fulfilled in Jesus, who came to die uh, on a cross and take the sin of humanity with him, to conquer death in the resurrection. So by God's wisdom, we're redeemed, we're rescued, restored back to God through faith in him. A relationship restored, one of trust and dependence, because of what Jesus has accomplished on our behalf. Yahweh is a good and great God, who shows us his faithfulness, and wisdom in Jesus. So when we take the big picture of the whole Bible, when we see the whole redemption history, the Proverbs are all about Jesus, aren't they? How to live wisely in this world, in Him. When we read the words of the fear of the Lord, what should should be echoed for us? Trust and love Jesus. Stand in awe and reverence of Jesus as the one who is our creator and fulfills the covenant and promises of God. So we heard, didn't we, that wisdom is a desirable, needed pursuit in this life. We heard that wisdom should be sought after however old or experienced you are. And to find wisdom begins with the fear of the Lord. Have you found that to be true of your story in your search for wisdom? I know many people who seek after wisdom and they trawl through books and science and philosophy and religion and psychology, history, Wikipedia, the internet. And they, and they try to understand the world we live in. All good things to do. It can be helpful to listen to the voices of those who have experiences that we haven't had before. Sometimes the self-help books can be helpful. I believe that we see God's fingerprints on all of it. When these authors and pop psychologists try to make sense of the world, it's God's uh, grace for our world, common grace for our world. But at the very heart of it, they will all fall short ultimately. They won't answer the question about why we have a heart that desires love so much. Why do we feel so insecure even when we have everything we need in life? Why do we feel so lost even though we have a uni degree or a career, relationships and marriage and kids and entertainment at our fingertips? Why do we still feel so lost? Our humanity is on an endless search for freedom and security and love, aren't we? And while people might be able to give you some answers that satisfy satisfy for a season, times change, people change, and no one person has all the answers. What if we could make sense of the world through the lens of the gospel, through a relationship with Christ himself who embodies the unique wisdom that only God possesses? Wisdom begins with a relationship, a relationship with Jesus. Seek him out. I have friends who struggle with who they are. They don't know what they're meant to do with their lives. Their job doesn't make them happy. They have anxious thoughts about their worth and value. They want to fit in but find they're always on the fringe. They think travel and food will make them happy, but that too fades and needs to be constantly fed. You and I, we have friends who need wisdom, don't we? I mean, I need wisdom too. Will Jesus be the start of wisdom for you, for them? Let me tell you what I've observed when I meet the people of God who have a relationship with Jesus, though. I discover a people whose lives are shaped around His goodness, His generosity, His love his joy, because they have made sense of the world around them, as God designed for this world to be. I don't want to say Christians are always happy and successful and thriving. They are sometimes, not always. But when we trust Christ, we find order, don't we, to our tumultuous world around us. Our hearts come to know the security and freedom and deep joy that only God can give. Without the fear of the Lord, we're often left feeling the chaos, the confusion, the anxiety. We feel lost. 
There'll be uncertainty about the decisions you make, your identity, your purpose, your meaning. And the existential, existential crisis is so real, isn't it? Wisdom begins with a relationship. A relationship with Jesus where we seek to trust him and love him. Let that seep into every area of our lives. And you know, that's the wisdom I tell everyone who comes to me asking for it. I am not a social media influencer. I'm not a self-help lifestyle blogger. And i definitely not a celebrity as far as I'm aware. But since becoming a pastor, right, people sometimes come to me and treat me like I'm some sort of guru, some sort of sage. They ask me, Mikey, who should I date? What do you reckon about, uh, what do you reckon about schools for my kids? Private, public? Mikey, should I take this job? Mikey, the boss wants me to wear purple at work. What should I do? Mikey, what do you think about investing in cryptocurrency? I get it. It's nice to be asked, sure. I would do the same too with my pastor. And I'm always open to giving advice and, and my experiences, my life experience. But I've learnt over the years, as I minister to people, my answers can only truly be helpful when it's shaped by and couched in the fear of the Lord, the wisdom that comes from the cross. You know, 1 Corinthians 1, it says, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. If I want the people I minister to, to thrive in life, to flourish, the wisdom I share must not be just like the world's. Believe in your flyness, conquer your shyness. No, it must come from Jesus. It must begin with the fear of the Lord. May we seek out wisdom at the cross of Christ. Walk with Him, love Him, obey Him, put your faith in Him, and you'll soon discover that God is like a lighthouse to guide your way. Trusting Jesus will put you on the right path in this world, as narrow as it might seem. And for those who are here at camp, who have yet to start that relationship with Jesus, let me invite you, you can start today. It'll be the wisest decision you make. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Christ, that he is our wisdom, that in him, Lord, we know how to live in this world that you've created. We're thankful for that, Lord, that we do have these lives to live, but we're also thankful for our relationship with you. As we live um, in this world, may we continue to come to you for that wisdom, come to Christ. And, and as, we, as we come to Christ, may we submit to him as our king in, in repentance and obedience, in fear, knowing that you are a good and great God. We do pray this in your son's name. Amen.